I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy walls, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sakes, I will now say, Peace be within thee, because of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek thy good. God is good. And all the time. Let's try that again. God is good. And all the time. Has God been good to you, yes or no? When was the last time? Right now. <laughs> Are you alive? God is good to you. Come on, say amen. amen. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. How was your thanksgiving? Did you eat? Did you have enough to eat? Did you say grace? <laughs> I'm not joking. There are millions of people around the world who do not know what a three-course meal is. They've never seen one. And so when you eat, thank God. And then say, Father, use me to ease somebody's hunger. It's a privilege to eat food. It's a privilege to turn on a tap and out comes water. It's a privilege to flick a switch and on comes the light. Are you listening to me? I am telling you what I have seen as God has sent me around. I was in a certain place preaching. I won't say where. And at night, people walk around with flashlights around their necks hanging like a tie. Because the light goes off all the time and you see all kinds of lights all over the campus. That's just life. There are people who walk miles to get water. Then they bring it, then they have to boil it. Wait for it to cool. We turn the tap, out comes the water. Their places, call the police, is a waste of time. You call them here, they come. You call the fire department, they come. You call whomever, they come. This, uh, let's thank God for his goodness. Are you with me? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. How many of you love God? Can I see your hand? Do you mean that? God bless you. Who's with us tonight? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? You are. We have a lovely lady right over here. Tell us your name, please. Yes? You're who? Oh, Mercedes, you've been here before. Oh, nice to see you. God bless you. We're glad you've come back. Come back tomorrow night. Come on, say amen. amen. Mercedes, God bless you. I really mean that from my heart. Anybody else? You're not a... Ah, what's your name? Gene oh, yes, Geneva. Ah, Geneva, you're not a guest anymore. <laughs> Geneva, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? Where? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You're visiting with us. Raise your, okay, what's your name? Beverly. Hello, Beverly. Nice to see you. God bless you. Thank you very much for coming. Anybody else? That's it? Oh, hi. What's your name? Heidi. Hi. Kyla. Hello, Kyla. Where are you from? You from? Oh, from here. All right, you're from here. All right, Kyla, God bless you. I really mean that. And for those of you online who are not Seventh-day Adventists, thank you very much for taking the time to fellowship with us. We are honored and delighted with your presence. Our subject for this evening, a storm is coming. What did I say? Now, this should make a lot of sense to people who live in Florida. Are you following me? A, st 
And from Jamaica, yes, anywhere in the West Indies or Southeast Asia where they have typhoons. We call them hurricanes. They call them typhoons. A storm is coming. Tonight, tomorrow night, and Sabbath, and we're done. Time has really flown very quickly. Before I get into the message, if you're not using one of these, please turn them off until they're dead. If you're using it, make sure the sound is down. Where's my little friend who comes with you? She, when I say, what will you take from the message, she's always the first one to tell I miss her. You know who I mean. Yeah, you tell I said hi. Okay, she's not here. Tell her the preacher ask about. They're coming. Ah, oh, well, tell them hurry up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Fear for number two. While I'm speaking, pray for me and say what? Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. What verse do I use? Now put a smile on my face and say it. What's wrong with this side? <laughs> then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. If God does not put his words in my mouth, Satan will put his words. God said, Thou shalt surely die. Satan said, Ye shall not surely die. We have two choices of sources of authority, God or Satan. Let me say it again. I've said it before. If it is not from God, it's from Satan. It may come through your wife, your husband, your friend, your boss, your pope, your priest, your president. If it is not from God, it's from Satan. Understand that very clearly. All right. What's the third favor I always ask? Think. What subject, what verse do we use? Isaiah 118, which says what? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. I like that about God. God is a reasoning God. Why have you stopped going to church, says God? Talk to me. Why are you doing this or that, says God? Let's talk. Cain, why did you kill Abel? Let's talk. Adam, what did you do? A reasonable God. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for preserving our lives. As we bow before you, loving Father, forgive us if we have sinned against you. We sin so easily. But just as easily as we sin there, God, just as easily you forgive when we say sorry. But put into our hearts, dear Father, a hatred for sin. Because the things we hate, we avoid. And give us love for righteousness. Bless everyone listening in this building and online. But pour out a special blessing on our guests. Father, remember little boys and little girls who are watching. Give them a sweet blessing to I pray. Bless this country. Guide the leaders, Father. And as I often ask you, remind them in your own way. That the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. And all of the countries represented by those watching, bless them, Father, I pray. Particularly bless your people in those countries. Now, Father, take full control of me and speak through me, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to James chapter 2. We'll read from verse 8 our subject, a storm is coming. It is now 10 minutes to 8. I'm grateful for the extra time. Baptism is the Sabbath. Get ready, get ready. It'll be the high day, not only on earth, but in heaven. Can you say amen? amen. The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 99 righteous persons that need no repentance. When one person is baptized, there is rejoicing in heaven. And you can hear it with the ear of faith. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from what verse? Read with me. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the commandment, what? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Now verse 10, read with me. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. We have to say that again. I'll say it slowly. There are no jokes in the Bible. Are you with me? There are no jokes. The Bible is life and death. God prefers life. Sinners choose death. 
whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Then when God requires obedience, what kind of obedience does he require? Total obedience. Partial obedience qualifies no one for a place in God's kingdom. God requires total obedience to his word. Now, verse 11, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. What law is he referring to? The Ten Commandments. He gives us two examples. No doubt, the Ten Commandments. If I were to say, identify this state, Tallahassee. <laughs> do I have to call every city? No. So he gives two commandments. We know he's referring to the Ten Commandments. Read verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be by the law of... James says you ought to live your life as though you understand that one day you will be judged. Understand it in that judgment will be the law of God, which the Bible calls the whole duty of man. Obedience that God accepts is total obedience. God is all or nothing. And so when God gave Christ, he gave <clears throat> everything. What he calls upon us to do is give everything to him. And so Jesus told the scribe in Mark chapter 12, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, come on, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Don't reserve one molecule. Total commitment to God as God made total commitment to us in the giving of his son. Now that we identified what obedience is and disobedience is, let us go to Revelation 14. What's our subject? A storm is coming. And let me tell you something. It is coming. It is if a storm were to hit sunrise tomorrow, and you were not told anything, you would vote the authorities out at the next election. You know what you would say? Why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you warn us? Every city has these things that make a lot of noise. In my city of Ann Arbor, from time to time, they test them. And they interrupt your television, and you see these uh, whatever to test, make sure that the alarm system works. Because we don't have hurricanes like you do. We have tornadoes sometimes. We have blizzards and snowstorms. And so we need warnings as well. And the Bible, I told you a few days ago, before we read Revelation 14, the very first words spoken by God to human beings was a warning. Let me go to one of my favorite passages. Can you guess what that is? Genesis 2, 16, 17. Read with me. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. It was a warning. And a warning is an expression of love. You don't agree? A warning. Parents, don't you warn your children. You warn your children. You tell your young boy, don't hang out with those boys. They'll take, they'll, 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 they'll cause you to get into trouble with the law. We warn our children. God is our father. We are his children in some sense. Those who obey him are truly his children. Those who don't are his by creation, but not by salvation. But he warns us. Now, let's read Revelation 14. We read from verse 9. This is the third of three messages that God has given to the world. To warn the world of what is coming. Are you with me? We read from verse 9. And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Stop. Let's look at the wrath of of God. The warning contains two things, the wrath of God and burning 
by fire. Are you with me? And we'll get to that. God will pour out his wrath into the cup of his indignation. And the verse says, without mixture. So all that cup will have is wrath. Complete wrath. You know, sometimes you buy a concentrate juice, and you put three parts water to one part concentrate, and you make your juice. Now, God's wrath is all concentrate. And it will be the only time in the Bible God has ever poured out that kind of wrath. He has not yet done it. It's coming. Now, let's read again. And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast... And now, to worship is to acknowledge the authority of someone or something. Over me, yes. You acknowledge the authority of a power over you. And you live in harmony with that power. That's worship. If any man worship the beast or his image and receive his mark in his forehead, you think it, or in his hand, you do it. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Let's look at the wine, the wrath of God. Let us go to Revelation 15. What is the wrath of God that has never been poured out on this earth? You have Revelation 15. You read from verse 1, what's our subject? A storm is coming. Read with me. Another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath. Ah, the wrath of God is in those seven vials. These are symbols, of course. God doesn't put his wrath in a cup. Are you with me? Revelation is a symbolic book. The wrath of God is in those seven vials, seven angels, each one has a vial. Go to Revelation 16. Well, before, we go, let's read verse 7 of Revelation 15. Verse 7. Are you there? Read with me. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, come on, full of the wrath of God, which liveth forever and ever. So we have the wrath of God in vials, Revelation 15.1, the wrath of God in vials, Revelation 15.7. It's good to repeat. Now, Revelation 16. Read from verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels which had the what? The, the seven vials, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now there's a command. Where does the command come from? Read carefully. The temple. From God. Yeah, from God himself. Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Now, the wrath of God talked about in Revelation is the final expression of God's hatred for sin. Not for people, for sin. But when God destroys sin, if he finds sin in me, he has no choice, finish my words, but to destroy me. That's why Christ came to get sin out of us. You're not with me. When Christ comes to destroy sin, he destroys it wherever he finds it. If through stubbornness he finds it in me, I will be destroyed. In my state of Michigan, we're in hunting season now. And all over the country, there's hunting season. Almost every hunting season, someone is accidentally shot. I thought he was a deer. <laughs> shot. What happens is the hunter is aiming maybe at a deer. And someone else just comes into the path of the rifle. He is now in the line, come on, of fire. The hunter wasn't aiming at him. He was aiming at the deer. God has a rifle of justice. He's aiming at sin. If sin is in you, <laughs> this is not a joke. You are in the line, come on, of fire. And God must pull that trigger. A God of love is a God of justice. We live in a world where people commit crimes and get away with it. And so we think that's the way God is. We sin, we sin, we sin, we get away with it, so we think. 
The Bible says, because sentence against an evil word is not speedily executed, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. We sin, nothing happened. We sin, nothing happened. We sin, nothing happened, we can see. We sin, nothing happened, so we sin and we sin and we sin. We think God is taking a nap. But your sins eventually, come on, catch up with you. Now, let us go back to Revelation 16. Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Verse 2, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and they fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and them which worshipped his image. There's a class of people that will worship a system called the beast. Even though you may not know what the system is right now, the point is they are worshipping it. And Jesus told Satan, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So even though you may not know exactly who that beast is, at least you know in the end time, people will be worshipping a system contrary to God's system. And the first plague falls on those. Verse 3, And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood, come on, of a dead man. Listen to me carefully. You won't believe it, but it'll happen. One of God's judgments on this earth, every ocean will turn to blood. Now, people don't come to church to hear this sort of thing. They come to hear how to get rich. I don't know how you can get rich. Maybe return a tithe. I don't know, but I know how to tell you get ready to escape the wrath of God. A storm is coming. All this, the Pacific Ocean becomes blood. Verse 4, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the fountain and rivers of water, and they became? Mm -hmm. Go to verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God. Come on. And they repented not to give him glory. The sun will be so hot, it'll be as if your skin is burning. Does this put you in mind of anything? Before God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, did he send plagues on Egypt? Yes, he did. And before he takes his people out of this world, he's going to send plagues on this world. In Egypt, all bodies of water became blood. Even the pots of water in houses turned to blood. Frogs came all over the land. Lice, boils, flies, hail, darkness, locusts. And the final plague, God destroyed every firstborn in Egypt, both of people and of animals. God sent plagues on ancient Egypt. Before he delivered his people, before he takes us out of this world, he will send plagues on this earth. Now, we are accustomed to catastrophes. In 210, was it 210 or 211, there was a terrible earthquake in Haiti. Almost 300,000 people died. Uh, no, shortly after that, there was a tsunami in, was it the Pacific Rim, I think they call it? Oh, over, almost 300 people lost their lives. There are earthquakes all the time, landslide. In the United States, we have forest fires. Small communities are wiped out completely. Catastrophes happen so often, we have become numb. There was a terrible earthquake in Morocco. It's often used now. It happened a couple of months ago. There was one in Turkey, often used. These catastrophes happen all the time. So it's nothing strange if God, who is all-powerful, can send catastrophes that exceed that to which we are accustomed. My friends, a storm is coming. But let's go back to Revelation 14. Let's read from verse 9 again and take a closer look at those who will qualify for these plagues. And I don't want you to be one. It is now ooh, already 10 after 8. You have Revelation 14. Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me as I speak. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And the third angel followed him saying with a loud voice, 
If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wrath of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Now, who is it that gets the wrath of God? Let us go to Ephesians chapter 5. Who qualifies for God's wrath? Ephesians 5. We read from verse 3. We read a list of sins from 3 to 5. Then we'll hit verse 6. Ephesians 5, 3 to 6. Our subject, a storm is coming. Do you have that? Read with me. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no homonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Finish the verse. For because of these things, stop. Stop. What's the these things? All those things mentioned in 3 to 5. Are you with me? Give me one word for them. And what is sin? Transgression of the law. Reason, reason. All of those things listed in 3 to 5, sin. What is sin? Transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4. Now, because of these things, because of sin or because of disobedience, Cometh the wrath of God, come on, upon the children of Ah. Ephesians 5 6 tells us God's wrath comes upon whom? Those who disobey Him, not those who ignorantly make a mistake. God is so merciful, in the times of ignorance, He winks, but commands all men now everywhere to repent because there are no benefits to ignorance when it comes to salvation. God wants you to know the way of life. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We ought to know God, know Christ, know salvation. But when someone is genuinely ignorant, God does not punish that person. So when we read in Ephesians 5 verse 6, For these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience, we understand willful intentional, deliberate, fragrant, high-handed disobedience. They call the children of disobedience. The wrath of God comes on them. Stay in Ephesians. Go to chapter 2. Let's read from verse 1. Ephesians 2, reading from verse 1. We're looking at the wrath of God and who qualifies. The children of disobedience. They also call something else, but the same thing. Do you have Ephesians 2? Reading from verse 1, read with me. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the children that now worketh, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, they're called the children of disobedience. Now, who works in them? Satan. Mm-hmm. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Which leads me to ask this question, what power leads a person to disobey God? The power of the devil. But it is the person who makes the choice. The devil may urge you. But you have to make the choice to disobey God. The Holy Ghost may urge you, you have to make the choice to accept Jesus Christ. Are you with me? And so there's one power urging you to disobey. There is another power urging you to obey. The choice is yours. But every human being is affected by two powers. This one says, disobey. This one says, obey. Among whom also we all had our conversation, verse 3, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. In verse 2, they're the children of disobedience. In verse 3, the children of wrath. The wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. We see that in Ephesians 5, verse 6. And so we go back to Revelation 14. And we'll read now down to 11. And
And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, I'm at verse 9, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Here comes the second part they suffer. And he shall be tormented with fire, come on, and brimstone in the presence of the, and of the, now pause, fire and brimstone. Go to Revelation 20. Hmm. Revelation 20. Let's read verse 15. And whosoever, come on, was not found, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. What's the book of life? <laughs> whosoever was not found, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. What is the book of life? Go to Exodus chapter 32. Let's read verse 31. Exodus 32, verse 31. This is after the Israelites were worshiping the golden calf. God almost destroyed them, but Moses interceded for them, and God spared them because God is merciful. Somebody say amen. All right. Do you have verse 31, Exodus 32? And somebody please remember to say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Read with me. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people hath committed a great sin, and hath made them what? Gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt, yea, but if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Moses says, you've got a book. Where you write the names of those who have given their lives to you. Moses knows he has a relationship with God, and he says, look, if you kill them, take my name out of your book. He's willing to die with them. Clearly, Moses was a prophet, you see. He's led by the Spirit of God. All Scripture is given how? By inspiration. So the Spirit leads Moses to remind you and me, God has a book. How the book exists, we don't know. We don't support, we're not supposed to care. We know God has a record. Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book. Now read verse 33. What does God say to Moses? And God said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, come on, him will I blot out of my book. Now, when you read whosoever have sinned against me, don't take that to mean whosoever has made a mistake. Whosoever practices sin, I, lifestyle, I will blot out of my book. Those are the ones on whom the wrath of God will come. Now let's go back to Revelation 14. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, in verse 12, read with me. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, we're introduced to a second group. Are you with me? The first group suffer the wrath of God. And the wrath of God comes upon whom? The disobedient. And disobedience is sin. What is sin? The transgression of the law. We read in James at the beginning, if you break one, come on. You've broken all. The wrath of God comes upon law breakers. Now, the opposite group is described as, here is the patience of the same. Here are they that keep the command. You see, in contrast to those in verse 9 to 11, we have a different group in verse 12. They do not suffer the wrath of God. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In the end time, we have two groups on this earth. Those who have qualified by a rebellious life against God for the wrath of God. And those who by faith in Christ have lived obedient lives. So we have two groups. 
One group, 9 to 11, the children of disobedience, they suffer the wrath of God. In verse 12, we have another group that is delivered by God. They're described as those who keep the commandments of God. In other words, we have disobey and obey. Question for you. Which one of God's commandments are you consistently breaking? And you know you're doing it. You've got to stop. Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You know why Christ had to come and die? Because of what sin? One sin. <laughs> what sin was that? Adam's sin. If no one else had sinned, Christ would still have to come and die because of Adam's one sin. The Bible says, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. One man, one mistake, and the Son of God had to give his life. If God had to come and die, Christ, because of one sin, you can understand why breaking one is breaking all. Because death is the punishment for the transgression of the law. The whole law. And one violation is the transgression of the whole law. Let me say again, I am not referring to one mistake. I'm referring to a life of knowing willful rebellion against thus saith the Lord. My brothers and sisters, there is a storm coming on this earth. There will be climatological disasters. There will be natural disasters. But orchestrated by God. You see, God's punishment is not accidental. It is deliberate. God has the right to punish. Because punishing sin also glorifies God. As much as saving a sinner glorifies God, punishing sin glorifies God. So God directly and deliberately punishes sin. The flood did not come accidentally. God sent it. Sodom and Gomorrah were not burned accidentally. God burned them up. There are some people who say, well, God doesn't destroy. God destroys He creates and he destroys. He gives life and he can take it. But his preference is to give life. And so I ask you again, don't tell me. Is the commandment of God you are deliberately, knowingly, intentionally, flagrantly, high-handedly disobeying? If the answer is an honest yes in the privacy of your soul, you should decide right where you are, finish my words, to stop. There is a saying, fall on the rock, and don't let the rock, come on, fall on you. It is better to stop yourself than to have God stop you. Because God does not have a pleasant way to stop a sinner. He does not have a pleasant way to humble a proud person. That's why the Bible says, humble yourself. And the brother of Jesus tells us that in James chapter 4, verse 7. Peter, that chief apostle, tells us in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, humble yourself. Uh, for 1 Peter 5, verse 6, humble yourself and come to God. Go to Jeremiah chapter 3 quickly as we continue. A storm is coming. It is uh, 25 after 8. Jeremiah 3, listen to how simple it is to escape the wrath of God. But don't escape the wrath of God because you don't want to be burned. Escape the wrath because you want to be with God. Are you with me? You want to live in His presence and talk face to face with Him. Jeremiah chapter 3, let's read from verse 12. Are you found it? Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go and do what? Proclaim these words where to the north and say what? Return thou backsliding Israel. Come on. Save the Lord and I will. 
I will not cause my to fall upon thee. Why? For I am merciful, saith the Lord, and will not. Will not do what? Forever. I will not keep anger forever. Now, read verse 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the law. Thy God stop. God says, look, just come clean and tell me I was wrong. That's what parents tell their children. Why didn't you tell me the truth? And God says to you and those of you online, acknowledge your iniquities. You have transgressed against the Lord. Tell God I was wrong. And before you could blink your eye, God will forgive you. Who is a God like unto thee? That pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. And so God says, only acknowledge thine iniquities, that thou hast transgressed against the law of thy God. Now let me be blunt right between the eyes. How many sins are required in order to break the whole law? One. You break one, you break all. The one most Christians break is a Sabbath commandment. They keep Sunday instead of Saturday. Even though there is no Bible support for Sunday, the first day of the week, they continue to do it. Some argue, well, my family has done it. I can't leave my family's church. Or my husband is that. I have to stay with it. Or whatever, whatever, whatever. And they don't think of God first. They think of what other people will say first. Let me tell you something. Other people cannot shield you from the wrath of God. Amen. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Not your husband, not your wife, not your children, not your boss, not your ex. No one should influence your thinking more heavily than God. And you and I must learn to say like Joshua, As for me and my house, come on. We will serve the Lord. I frequently comment on this verse. Notice what Joshua says, as for me and my house. He could have just said, as for my house. Are you with me? But he realizes he is an individual in his house. So as for me and my house. In other words, if my house decides to leave God, are you with me? I will serve God. You know how sin came into the world? A man put his wife ahead of God. You don't believe me? <laughs> listen to the Bible. Just listen. Re uh, not Revelation. Genesis 3.17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife instead of me. That's what God is saying. Now God gave Eve to Adam. Don't misunderstand me. God wasn't trying to break up the family, but there is no circumstance under which you and I can put anyone ahead of God. You see, that's why Jesus says, you come to me, count the cost. It's tough. You may have to leave a cherished thing to follow me, the same way I left heaven to come save you. I was saying, the one sin that most Christians commit is this observing of Sunday as the Sabbath, which it is not. And I have to say it publicly so no one can say he didn't say it. I'm telling you now, go check with your priest, your pope, your whomever. Show me in the Bible where the first day of the week is a holy day. No one will show you. Because it's not there. The wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience and according to the bible you don't need to directly disobey all you simply have to disobey one to disregard the authority of god and accept the authority of someone else the bible says in acts 5 29 we ought to obey god come on rather than man and it was a man that said the first day of the week is a day of rest it was a man his name is constantine he passed that law in 321 a.d 
And then the church picked it up in 364 at the Council of Laodicea. And in Canon 29, or Rule 29, at that council, 364, 363, there's some debate over the exact date. But there's no debate over that law they passed. Canon 29, rest on Sunday. Let no one be found Judaizing on the seventh day. In other words, behaving like a Jew. Anyone who does will be anathema. Do you know what anathema means? You're cast into hell, out of Christ. You're damned and you're cursed. That's why Paul said, if any man preach any of the gospel unto you or any angel, let him be accursed. It was a man who came up with Sunday as a day of rest, not God. And the Bible says we ought to obey God rather than man. And so I say to you directly, if you, are, if you didn't know that the Sabbath is not Sunday, now you've heard it. You don't have to take my word. Go talk to your priest. Pick up the Bible. Read it and search it. Just read the Ten Commandments. There are people who say when Christ died, he fulfilled the law. <laughs> have you ever heard that? He fulfilled the law. I don't have to keep it. They don't mean the whole law. No one will argue when Christ died, he fulfilled thou shalt not kill, so I don't have to keep it. No one will say when Christ died, he fulfilled thou shalt not steal, so I don't have to keep it. Everyone accepts nine. No problem with nine. You still have to avoid stealing, avoid killing, avoid adultery, avoid lusting, avoid this, avoid disrespecting your parents. Avoid yes! But they pick one, and they say, when Christ died, he destroyed that one. Which one is that? The Sabbath commandment. The one in the middle that connects the two tables together. The one that identifies God as having authority to request your worship. Because he is creator of heaven and earth. The only one that begins with remember. And so as I come to the slope, downward slope of storm is coming Make a decision. Escape the wrath to come. Let me say it again. God will pour his wrath upon this earth. And it will be something no one has ever seen. One of the plague number seven. There will be an earthquake such as never was since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Verse 21, and they fell upon men a great plague out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent, about 100 pounds. There will be boulders coming down from the sky. Now from Michigan, I know sometimes we have hailstones the size of golf balls. They can destroy your car. Uh, if you're in Texas, same thing. There are hailstones so large, they can ruin your car. The Bible says God will send some hailstones. A hundred pounds each and will devastate the earth. Those who obey God will be shielded. You have to stop and think. When John the Baptist was baptizing in Luke Matthew chapter 3, he said to the Pharisees, O oh, generation of vipers, who hath what? Warned you to flee from the wrath to come. John said, You know something is coming and you're running. Where he was glad they ran, they got baptized. Now I'm saying to you, I'm not saying no generation of vipers, I'm simply saying, <laughs> flee from the wrath to come. Destruction is coming on this earth for one reason, sin. And people have rejected, rejected, rejected Christ. And even though God is eternal and infinite, God can only take so much rejection. Then he has to come. He destroyed the ancient world, and the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The same Jesus says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And if God does not do something to this world, he has to say sorry to Noah's world and the world of Lot. My call to you tonight, make a decision to be on the side of God. And that's a decision to obey God. Obey God's commandments. This is not salvation by works. This is an expression of love. Because Jesus said, if you love me, come on, keep my commandments. 
Obedience is love in action for God. It is not legalism or salvation by works. And so God is calling upon us to obey him. The same way disobedience qualifies a person for destruction, obedience through Christ qualifies us for a place in God's kingdom. And so in the last book of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 14, say it with me, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Notice carefully, they may have a right. Now Adam had that right, but he lost it through what? Disobedience to God. And the Bible says we get it back through obedience to God. Can you say amen? Don't lose your place in God's kingdom. I want you to make a decision, as I said earlier, to obey God. If you feel weak, ask him to help you. That's his speciality, helping the weak. You know, in Psalm, I think it's Psalm 6, have mercy upon me, O God, for I am weak. It's a beautiful verse. Psalm 6, verse 2. Have mercy upon me, O God, for I am weak. O God, help me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also so vexed. But thou, O Lord, how long? I am weak. Psalm 103, verse 13. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Next verse. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth we're dust. Or he remembers we're weak. Christ came because we're weak. To strengthen the weak. And we can say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Would you stand with me? Let me pray. It's uh, 25 to 9. Heads bow. While I pray, you must also pray in your heart. Father in heaven, no human being can perfectly preach truth except Christ. Whatever meager effort I made, I ask today, God, to let your spirit now do an extra work to make it clear to those who heard. Father, you're a God who would have all men to be saved. But the tragedy is, as Jesus said, the road to destruction, there are many. The road to salvation, there are few. Father, I want to believe that among the few are those under the sound of my voice. Lord, as I make this appeal, let your spirit move upon those who ought to take action. You've heard me say, if you're willfully, deliberately disobeying one of God's commands, you ought to stop. If that applies to you, and you want spiritual power to stop, I want you to come. Let's pray down front. There is an area in my life where I'm willfully disobeying God, I know I am wrong and I want to stop. Father, help me. Come now and we'll pray. There's an area in my life of disobedience. Come. Online, come in your own way. Come in your heart. There's an area in my life where I'm displeasing God. I want to stop. And I'm asking you to come. We'll come right here and we'll pray. I have a spiritual challenge. I need help. Come. God wants you saved. He does not want you lost, but he cannot save anyone in disobedience. Do not be tough with God. Come as a weak person. There is an area in my life where I am displeasing God. Come, let us pray. Do not be afraid. Come. Someone else come. All to Jesus, sing softly. All to Jesus, I surrender. God bless you. To Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. I surrender oh, Someone else come There's an area in my life where I need help I need help to stop what I'm doing Come Yes All to thee 
my blessed Savior, I surrender. Oh, and this call is also for those of you online. There's an area in your life you need to surrender to Christ. Do that now as the Spirit of God speaks to you and pleads with you. By thy feet I bow, worldly pleasures not forsake me, take me Jesus, take me now. Who else is coming? Surrender all. I surrender all. Jesus is waiting. He wants to save you. He really does. There is an area in my life I need to surrender to Christ. Come. Sing very softly, very softly, very softly. 60 seconds and I pray. What's the call? There's an area in my life I know I ought to stop. But I keep doing it. Come. I know I am wrong. I know I'm offending God. In His mercy, He's kept me alive. Not to continue, but to finally come and say, Father, I have been wrong. Come. 45 seconds. God is merciful, but His mercy has limits. 40 seconds. Then I'll pray. There is an area of rebellion in my life. And I'm coming to put that at the feet of Christ. And online, make that choice. Make that choice, please. make a final call very simple many people are in church physically but in their hearts they have drifted far from God if that's you come drifted far from God but physically in the church you want to renew your walk with Christ come 30 seconds is all I have drifted far from God and I know it I'm coming back, and by His grace, I'll drift no more. 20 seconds, come. Calling those who've drifted from God, and I mean drifted. 15 seconds. The first call, there's an area of willful disobedience. I've come to lay it down and seek power to stop. The second call, I have drifted from God, and I'm coming back. 15 seconds. The best time to make this decision is now, not tomorrow night, now, while you have life and you have the opportunity. Five seconds. Come, come. Online, come in your own way in this building. Come. I'm going to pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, I can save no one. I can convict no one. You've called me to preach and leave the rest to you. But Father, you've put on my heart a burden for souls. And so it breaks my heart when I know there's someone who needs to come, but is not coming. I don't know the person's name. You do. But there's someone who needs to come, who has not yet come whether in this building or online, but surely in this building. But Father, I leave that person to you and your persistent spirit. Now, dear God, remind those who've come that have made the right decision. You will help them, Father, to put away that area of willful rebellion against you. That they may be found on the side of those who are saved, not on the side of those who suffer your wrath. Because your wrath, dear God, will be terrible. That's why you delay and delay. You know how terrible your wrath is. Father, 
wrestle with that woman who needs to come wrestle with that man who needs to come dear God and father let me pause for 15 seconds and say someone else come in answer to this call there's an area in my life where I am stubbornly disobedient I want to stop come let's pray come 15 seconds come online same thing respond to the call there is an area of my life where I'm stubbornly disobedient come 10 seconds come come God bless you my sister God bless you God bless you come five seconds an area of stubborn disobedience come let me close the prayer father I have to release your people that they may go home but as I release them father do not release them from the conviction of your spirit and that woman who should have come give her no rest until she falls at the foot of the cross that man who should have come bother him trouble him harass him into the kingdom dear God he or she will be glad now father as we leave let your patient angels protect us let your hard working spirit convict us let decisions be made during the night that will be expressed tomorrow bring us back again I pray in Jesus name let God's people say amen and amen before you sit what will you take from the message or you may sit what will you take from the message In his great love, God tells us how to escape his wrath. Yes. You break one, you break all. Someone else, what will you take from the message? My must stop sinning. And God gives the power. I decide, God empowers me. Someone else, what will you take from the message? Yes, my brother. The wrath of God falls on the children of disobedience. The Bible is clear. Your question must be, am I a child of disobedience? One more. Yes, sister. God's book, the book of life, contains names. And those who disobey, the name will be removed. Mm -hmm. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Let God's people say amen and amen. Good night, everyone. Good night to my friends online. As you leave, remember to keep the speed limit. We will see you tomorrow, God willing.